we are here tonight to be inspired by the life of the Roman Rav Chaim Shmuel and Yaakov Mechiel Pereira. That's how. I'm up here tonight for the room because my father in law was Shiva, Rav Nuhin, asked me to be the MC, and it was my schos to help facilitate the today hospital and words of inspiration that we're going to hear tonight. Chatzchayim Yeshiva was not glowing. And after being around for quite a few years, it still had the appearance of a fledgling Yeshiva. It was at that time that the Yeshiva, Zechatzah of Avracha, and Rubitz, asked my Zedi, have the meaning to become a Mishkiach in Yeshiva. It was almost 60 years ago. There was no one else at that time who was helping the Rosh Yeshiva. He was all alone. And when Rabbi Neumann took that position, he was the only other member of the Anhala that helped the Rosh Yeshiva. At that point, Rabbi Naiman instilled accountability in the yeshiva, which thereby enabled a maintenance of stability. And the yeshiva was able to grow. Not only was he responsible for the yeshiva to be able to remain afloat, but he was responsible for its ability to grow. And many will attest to the fact that he is directly responsible for the development of the Talmudim in the yeshiva who have reached great heights and started yeshivas of their own. He has no small portion of every branch that the yeshiva has grown, and certainly this one. Therefore, it is fitting and incumbent upon us to take the opportunity tonight to remember and reflect upon the life of Moreno Harav Chaim Shmuel Ben Yaakov Yechiel Halevi Zatzal. It is my schos now to call upon the Rosh Hashiva and the oldest son of the Nifter, Rav Naiman Shlita. I thank everybody for coming. <clears throat> I know people have busy schedules, day and night. I think it's important to emphasize our appreciation, the family's perspective, the tremendous outpouring of, of people that came over the last month, came and called, emailed, shared with us stories. has been a tremendous, tremendous inspiration, tremendous nechama for the entire family. And we express our appreciation and thanks for that. Chazal tell us, tovel eches lebeis ovel, mil eches lebeis hamishta. It's more beneficial, it's better to go to a base ovel, to a mourner's house, than to go to a base hamishta, a house of simcha, of party. It seems to me, there's, there are numerous purposes in having the shloshim and having has paid them. <clears throat> the Gemara talks about whether or not it's the benefit of the of the of the chayim, those who are still alive, whether it's for the benefit of, of the nifter. Chazal talk about how, at least for the first year, this machoksim, but many say for the first year the the neshama of the of the nifter is still attached to this world. And therefore, there's a tremendous amount of cover the nachas ruach that the neshama gets. 
when we speak about his, his milus and his mitzvahs and Torah mitzvahs. <clears throat> On the other hand, it's obvious, quite obvious for, the, for those of us here in this world, when we are masked, when we hear and we speak about the Torah mitzvahs, the Maisim Tovim, which a nifter was involved and performed, it's a benefit for us. Number one, it's a benefit because when we speak about it, we're machazic ourselves, this is what we should strive for. It's like when a person davens three times a day, the same thing every day. The repetition is just trying to ingrain within us those feelings, those hargashos, those attributes, those values. When we speak about it from a nifter's perspective, the same thing happens. We grow in our appreciation. We develop and, and, and absorb a greater hakara of Torah mitzvahs, the value chashivas of it. But maybe even more than that, and probably more than that, we come to be inspired, hopefully effectuate change within ourselves, which is a schus for obviously ourselves and a schus for the nifter. The question that <clears throat> I guess has, been, has arisen many times over the last month, people have asked, I guess I have asked, we've all asked, how could it be, how could it be that someone, a young boy, <clears throat> excuse me, a young boy, a 13 year old boy, grows up in Rockford, Illinois, a small town outside Chicago, no yeshiva, small Talmud Torah, very little ruchnius, one orthodox shul. And he ends up, he leaves Rockford at 13 years old, approximately 12, 13, I don't know exactly what, you, what, how, what the exact age was, he leaves Rockford at that time. He eventually works on himself, grows and becomes a mashkiach, magachir, and what eventually becomes one of the biggest yeshivas in the country, Chavis Chaim Yeshiva in Queens, New York. How could it be? What happened? What, what caused this? And as Rabbi Harris, Rabbi David Harris, the Roshiv Queen said at the Levaya and later at the Shloshim last week, he said, it wasn't just he was involved in yeshiva, but he was, I guess you call it the linchpin. He was the person who worked to implement, to strategize, to set structure, the rules, and the way the yeshiva conducted itself in all regards. He was the Roshiv's right-hand man. He was dedicated, devoted to every word the Roshiva said. And it was his job to implement all those policies. So he wasn't just a member, not even just a, a, not, not a passive, not even just an active member, but a member of the Anhala. He had that tremendous chuka, a tremendous drive, that yearning for Torah, for Ruchnius, to be an Eved Hashem, to be a servant of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to be a Shalem, a greater, man of greater perfection. Tremendous drive, tremendous chuka. But that's only half the answer. There are many people in the world that we find, they really want to become a great, they want to become B'nai Torah, they want to become Sadiqim, they want to become Doi Ador. You find many 10 years old, 13 year olds, 15 year olds, 20 year olds. I want to become the God of Ador. I want to become the greatest Roshiva. And the chuk is real, it's, it's sincere, it's not just phony. What makes the difference between someone who has the chuka and becomes a leading Roshiva and Manik and Kai Yisrael and someone who ends up being an average Ben Torah, a good Ben Torah, but not tops? What's the difference on both sides? There's a medrash that's quoted that I heard, I didn't see it, I'm not sure exactly where it is. There's a medrash that says, the medrash asked the question, what pasuk, what pasuk in Torah defines for us the essence of Torah, of what it means to be a Jew, what's incumbent upon a Jew? And there's a three way machokis, there are three different opinions, three different shitos. Ben Zoma says, it's the Pasuk of Shema Yisro, Hashem Hashem Echad. 
that relationship that we have with our Kodesh Baruch Hu, that commitment, that belief, that Kodesh Baruch Hu, is it. That's it. Everything. Ben Pazi says, you have to reach kamocha. Ben Olam Chaveiro. How one interacts with his chaveirim, with his friends, his peers. Shimon Ben Pazi said, he quotes the Pasuk, Es ha-keves ho-echot ta-sev ha-boker, v'yes ha-keves ha-sheri ta-sev bein ho-arboyim. The korban min korban tamid. When the Pasuk talks about how the korban was brought in the morning and the afternoon every day. And in fact, the Rebbe, at the end of the Mishnah, at the end of the Mishnah says that Rabbi Shimon Ben Pazi was correct. He was right. He is the one that has it. Es ha-keves ho-echot ta-sev ha-boker. What is pshat? What does that mean? What's so unique about that Pasuk? Karbanos, that's, we're not into Karbanos, especially nowadays. Are we missing everything? What's Pshat? So the Maral in Guru Aryeh says, Pshat is, the Karban Tabit was brought every day, every afternoon, consistently, day in, day out, weekday, Shabbos, Yom Tov, doesn't make any difference. That consistency is what the Torah is machshif so much. That's what we learn. That's what the Karban Tabit stands for. And that's the essence of a Jew, of Torah. My father was, as far as I know, he wasn't known to be an Iwi, he wasn't a child prodigy, but yet he knew Halacha, Svar, Iyun, Yeshiva Shared, Hashkafa, Shev Shmaisa. Stories, even jokes. He had a whole repertoire. Where did he get it from? He was not an Iwi. He didn't have a photographic memory. He got it because he had that consistency. That consistency is something, you might call it self-control, persistence, day in and day out. He took the chuk, he had the drive he had to accomplish, to be sholem, to be an Hashem, and he never let go of it. That itself is a mida. That's a challenge that we all have. That's our tachas, our challenge in life. Even though we know what's right, to be consistent. People have a tendency, the first day they come to, to the yeshiva, the first day of the zman, they're excited, they're learning, their hasmat is tremendous. Second day, third day, fourth day. It might go on for a week, for two weeks, maybe for a month. Then things start to slide and go downhill. The enthusiasm is lost. The consistency is not there anymore. That's the challenge that we all have. Every day, morning, afternoon. I think that's what made the difference for my father. We spoke on Shabbos with the Mnei Yeshiva. The Pasuk in Pirik the, the, the Mishnah says, Al Tomer Kishefna Efna, Kishefna Eshna. Don't say, I have 15 minutes now. Tveris Yisrael says, Pshat, I have 15 minutes now. It's not so much, not so chashev. I'm going to wait till I have an hour to learn. I'll learn later on. Says the mission, don't do that. First of all, because it might never happen. But very strong adds because of the fact that every 15 minutes is chashiv in its own right. It has its own chashivas and has its own chiyuvim. If you wait 15 minutes from now, you miss the opportunity. So you're growing every time, every ob obligation. You can't replace it by learning in 15 minutes from now or learning in an hour from now. But, what, but what, what the first Medrash talks about is a higher level, not just to be able to accomplish more in terms of more time and more chiyuvim, but the fact that a person's consistent itself is such a mileless, brings a person, makes a person, could bring a person to the highest level of godless that a person can reach. Just for training purposes. It has a different impact. Develops a person to be consistent, whatever he does. That's what my father emphasized, day in and day out. He would get up in the morning, before we got up, went to sleep, after we went to sleep. Consistently, not just on his good days. I guess you can say there were no bad days. I don't know, I never saw him upset, I never saw him depressed. Could be I wouldn't know, but he wasn't depressed, he wasn't down, he was up all the time. And I think it's the maira, the midah of consistency, to keep that momentum, keep the focus, keep the koach keep the perspective, what am I doing here? Keep the excitement of the first day of this month. Keep the excitement of the first days of a person's marriage. A first day of a new job. He's excited about the job. To keep the focus, not lose it.
I don't think, I can't swear to it, but I don't recall any time my father ever took a vacation in his life. I don't think so. And I both say, please keep in mind, these are divrei inspiration. We're not expected to follow suit on this level. But if we see someone, if Hillis Mechaivis Hanim, you see someone reach a certain high level, it enables us to reach a higher level. So no one should get depressed if they're not, if they take a vacation. I think we need it. So I'm not trying to mislead anybody. But I don't think he ever took a vacation. He probably didn't need it. Probably because he was so inspired on a regular basis, he never lost that momentum, that consistency. Rabbi Rodin at the Shloshim last week mentioned when he was first here in Yeshiva in 1968, he was in Eretz Yisrael with the Yeshiva, and Yeshiva took a trip down to Eilat before Pesach, a little tour, little tour down to Eilat. And he sees, lo and behold, Rabbi Naim is getting on the bus. He's joining the boys. Okay, very nice, very impressive. He goes with the boys on a, on a trip. Rabbi Naim was sitting in the back, next to the back row, the back seat, and he sees he took up two seats, not because he needed two seats, because he was sitting in one seat, and the seat next to him, there was a tape recorder. What's he doing with the tape recorder on the, on the trip to Irat? Has Rabbi Naiman lost it? Rabbi Naiman, so he asked somebody, he asked the Chavar, what's Rabbi Naiman doing with the tape recorder? What's he doing over there? And he told him, he's Chazering Shir. Chazering, his own Shir? Who's the Shir he Chazering? Yes, he Chazered, my father used to Chazer his own Shirim. Not because, he was, not because to take pride, not because he was ecstatic about it, but when you think about it again, and hear what you said, to get a new insight, say it a little differently, a new Chiddush. That's why he chazed his own shurim. And that's what he did on the trip down to Eilat, when he wasn't talking to boys. He made sure no moan would go un, un, unutilized. Every moan would be utilized to its fullest. Chazer shir. Take a shlep a tape recorder. He used to come down to Miami, Baruch Hashem, relatively often. You know what the hardest part was to bring him down to Miami? to transfer his office from New York to Miami. His office was a couple suitcases, briefcases of tape recorders and notebooks and, and cassette tapes and CDs or computers, whatever, it depends what time, of the, what the, time of, the, of the century. That's what it was. That's what his life was. There was no bathing suits. There was no suntan lotion. There was no plans of triptychs to figure out where to go. You know, Ben Asmanim was just to go wherever he had to be. He came down, whether it was to visit us, to machazig us, to teach, to give my shir for a couple weeks a year. Whatever it was, he had to make the fullest of it. The fullest was accomplished if he had his treasure with him, if he had his trove of, 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 of briefcases. He was so motivated but he was so normal. You know, usually you think of someone who's very driven and wants to accomplish, and wants to be a God of Ador, wants to become a Talmud Chacham. You can't talk to him. He's so inspired, there's no time for anybody else. If you interrupt him, he gets upset. Don't bother me, I'm trying to learn now. He was so relaxed. You could sit with him and joke with him, tell stories with him. He understood people, that people were different. People had different situations, different challenges. My brother Naftali, at the, at the Siyam Moshe Shabbos, he spoke. He gave him permission to say this over. He said that when he was first out of high school, he went to the yeshiva, went to Beis Medrash. He wasn't doing that well. Couldn't sit down all day long, walking around the Beis Medrash, walking around the dining room, the yeshiva, outside, inside, whatever it was. It wasn't really for him. He couldn't adjust to the full day, the rigid schedule of the full day yeshiva. What happened? So obviously he was nervous. My father, my father calls him over one day and says, Naftali, come here. So my brother expected a, you know, a, a yelling at, a, you know, different musr, you know, words of reproach. What are you doing? What's going on? You're wasting away your life. What are you doing with yourself? It's not appropriate. It's not, what, it's not the way a Ben Torah should act. And probably subconsciously, you're my son. How can you act this way? That's not what the speech was about. My father told him, Naftali says, you do what you have to do. The fact that I'm Rosh Hashiva, the fact that I'm a Magachir, the fact that I'm Machanich, it's not necessarily your job. 
Hashem wants from you certain goals, certain aspirations. It's not related to what I am. That was an example. Chanoch and Pidarko. My father understood this way before the psychologist understood this, way before it became the latest rage in the educational field. Every child is different. And there was no reputation of his own he had to live up to. Every son was different. He was so motivated, my father. But nevertheless, as I mentioned before, he was an avid member to the Roshiva Zatzal. He implemented everything the Roshiva wanted implemented, whether it was Hashkocha, whether it's chasing down boys in the dining room, what are you doing at Seder time, whether it's the dormitory, whether it's Seder time, getting out of bed in the morning, whatever it was. You might call them menial jobs, not exciting jobs, not, definitely not jobs which bring popular recognition. They weren't so popular. He did in a good way. He was very talented in that regard. But still, who wants those jobs? And especially if you're motivated. I want to become a Talmud Chacham. I want to give a better shir. I want to become a God Rador. Who has time to waste for these menial jobs? It didn't bother him. That was Ratzon Hashem. That was being an to Hashem. And he was so happy throughout, even the last years, when he was shvach, <clears throat> he was shvach, he couldn't go to Minyan all the time, he couldn't learn like he wanted to, but he was happy. Why was he happy? Because he was doing Ratzon Hashem. Rabbi Harris said over at the Shloshim, I think it was at the Shloshim, he said over that when Rabbi Harris was a young Talmud in Yeshiva, back in the early 60s, he had a discussion with his parents, like many Yeshiva boys do. His parents at that time, you know, learning was not that popular, coal was not that popular, learning all day was not that popular for sure. It was a yachid who became a full-time bentor and a coal young man. And his parents wanted to start going to college, make a parnasa, or at least learn how to make a parnasa, get a college degree. So Rabbi Harris was going back and forth. Rabbi Harris said to his parents, Daddy, Mommy, do you think all that counts is making money? Do you think all that counts is having a big house and a fancy chandelier and a beautiful car? What about being happy? Doesn't that also make for a difference? So Rabbi Harris said to his father, he says, he says, look at Rabbi Nyman, he says. Look at Rabbi Nyman. The man, it looks like, and he was right, <clears throat> the man has no money. He has no money. He's barely making ends meet. But he's the happiest person in the yeshiva. The happiest person in the world. It didn't make a difference to him. No money, hardships, didn't make a difference. Why? Because he had that mission in life, to be the Ever Hashem, to do Ratzon Hashem. And I think that's what, that's why we have Rabbi Harris, this yeshiva today. That was part of it, I guess. He saw that you can be happy being a Ben Torah, being a Rashiva. Of course, you have to make a Parnassah. We're not discounting that. We're not ignoring that. But you can make a Parnassah. It could be a minimal Parnassah. Hashem somehow provides. We've seen Nisim in the Yeshiva here. I've seen Nisim in my parents' family throughout the years. And he was such a czar as my father. My brother David told over when he spoke to the high school last week in Queens, my brother was 17 years old, just out of high school, starting base medish, just maybe just finishing high school, I don't know exactly. My father says, let's have a Seder. Let's have a Seder before davening. My brother says, yeah, he probably had no choice. He couldn't say no. So my father, we lived about three and a half blocks from the yeshiva. So my father goes out the first day, they walk into the yeshiva. My father says, let's run to the yeshiva. My brother says, why do you want to run? We're not late. We're on time. It's three and a half blocks. And also recognize my father was about, was about 50 years old at that time. He wasn't a young spring chicken. What's, what are you running for? My father said to him, well, there's two reasons. What do you mean? First of all, it's healthy. And that was the reality. My father was always careful about his health, the exercise, always watching. Remember in the, in, <laughs> excuse me, right, but I remember in, there was a little card hang up in the bathroom upstairs in the later years. 
on it was written day to day what my father's weight was, how much he weighed. He was very careful to be careful about that. That was part of taking care of yourself. So my father tells me, my brother David, he says, you have to be healthy, do exercise. You have a chance to run for a couple blocks, run. Why should you walk? And second of all, which was probably the most prominent reason, he says, we're going to learn Torah, we're going to do a mitzvah. What do you mean? We should walk? Hurry. Get there faster. Show your excitement. Show your reasons. And wherever we pass by on the way to the yeshiva, every single person, a Jew, from, not from, Goy, all colors, doesn't make a difference. Hello, good morning, how are you? And it wasn't natural, it wasn't, it wasn't a show. You didn't have to remember to think about how do I treat, how do I greet someone in the morning? It was a natural thing, good morning, how are you? You might be in conversation with, with David, but good morning, how are you? Someone mentioned over the story, he was walking to the yeshiva, my father sees a pen in the driveway in someone's front yard, in the driveway. Picks the pen up, goes to the front door, knocks on the door, the, ha- the homeowner opens the door, my father says, did you lose this? It was on your front, on your front, on your driveway. The person looks at him. Huh? Who are you? What are you talking? What is this all about? Shocked. Who does that? Who does that, Rabbi say? That someone, you know who does that? Someone who cares about his fellow human being because he cares about doing Ratzon Hashem, because he wants to become an Ever Hashem, because he wants to serve our college Baruch Hu. That's who does that. We should be Zohar Rabbi say to be inspired, to follow in his footsteps. He was very proud of coming down to Miami. Many people down here knew him through his, through his trips down here. We should all be inspired to live according to his teachings. I asked Mechila if we didn't treat him properly, we didn't respect him enough compared to what he deserved. We have the schus to have with us tonight the Rosh Yeshiva in Chavetz Chaim in Queens. I would now like to call upon the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Chavetz Chaim and son-in-law of the Nifter, Harav Grimblat Shlita. My Shver, the Nifter, had many, many outstanding attributes. And uh, anyone who's been following the various Hespedim have probably heard some of these things. He was an incredible Masmid. He used to have Chavrusas early in the morning, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning until davening. He had Chavrusas late at night, would stay up late learning. In fact, during the Shiva, somebody told me a story, and I can't remember who told me the story, so I can't properly quote him, that he came to Queens, the yeshiva, and let's just say the facilities in Forest Hills um, were not exactly, uh, you know, luxury suites. And it was in the dormitory late at night, and the door to one of the dorm rooms got jammed, and they could not open it. And the people inside were stuck. They started banging on the door. Maybe somebody could open it from the outside. So some guys came from the outside, and they couldn't open it either. So what are we going to do? So the guy said, I'll see if there's anyone around in the building who could help. So the guy went downstairs, was looking around, and he sees a light coming from Rabbi Nyman's office slash here room. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. He knocks on the door, Rabbi Nyman's there learning. He said, Rabbi, you know, somebody's stuck in the dorm room. Oh, it's okay, I have a toolkit here. He pulled out of the closet a toolkit, Anybody knows Rabbi Nyman, he had a very practical side to him also. Let me just say that everything I know about cars, I learned from Rabbi Nyman. He comes with the toolkit, and he opened the door. But he was there quietly, learning at 2 o'clock in the morning. He was an incredible unav. He was interested in what anybody had to say. And, and you said anything halfway decent, he came after you with the tape recorder. Wanted it down, you had, to, you had to say it over. You heard something from somebody, it's on the tape. Rev Steinberg, or Perrett Steinberg, the rubber of the Angus of Queens Valley in, in, in Kewgarden Hills, 
spoke at the Shloshim, and he mentioned, I've seen this with my own eyes, I know exactly what he was talking about, that Rabbi Naim would be in Shul, and if somebody was saying a shir, between Mincha or any other time, he'd be sitting there in rapt attention, leaning forward at the edge of his chair, regardless of who it was, some, you know, whatever, no, not a necessarily a famous personality, getting up, saying it, just whatever he's saying. Tremendous anova. He was medaktek be mitzvahs ba halacha, not from a shtick, but precise halacha. And you heard already mentioning his devotion to his Rebbe, to the Rosh Hashivah Zetzar of Hanukhlibuitz. I remember when I was in his shir a lot of years ago, and there was Baba Kama, Sechus Baba Kama, Shiva has a shir in Baba Kama, Basame Korazlina. Which, um, and we, Rabbi Naiman decided to bring our shir to that pilpul shir. And we prepared for it in advance in shir going through the Mari Makomos. We came to the pilpul shir. He made such a big deal out of it. I remember it's just like the most exciting thing that ever happened to me in my life. We're going to the Rashiva's pilpul shir. He had a way of building it up. But that's not really what I wanted to focus on this evening. I wanted to focus on something else. Something which I think reflects on the Torah personality in general, and specifically in my father-in-law. There are a number of things, a number of attitudes, midos, I don't know exactly what you want to call it, that are needed to be matzliach in life, but some of them are self-contradictory. Some of them conflict with the others. And a person has to live a life of paradoxes. And there's a balance. Rashi famously used to quote the Pasuk and Chazal, Gilu Birada, rejoice in fear. How could you rejoice in fear? But you can. And this is not something that Chachma, that wisdom can bring you to. It's only something that Torah can bring you to. And if a person internalizes Torah and Musr, they are able to strike these incredible balances between conflicting source forces. And somehow, carried off. Rabbi Naiman was pretty tough. He didn't let you get away with anything. He wasn't afraid to tell you off. I could tell you for sure if any one of your Rabbi and Rosh Hashivas today would do what he did, you know, there'd be nobody left in the Yeshiva. And yet, people felt his love. And people were macabre. There's a medrash in Kohalas Rabbah, Parsha Yud, Os Aleph, depending on the editions, quotes the Pasuk, Imruach HaMoshe Tala Alecha Mekomcha Al Tanach. And the medrash darshans it, if Ruach HaMoshe Tala Alecha, you become like a Moshe, the Ruach of leadership comes upon you, Mekomcha Al Tanach, don't leave your spot. Don't Become a Balgaiva. Don't feel superior. And it brings the example of Zechariah ben Yehoyada. Yehoyada was a Kohen Gadol and Zechariah was his son. And he was a Navi. He was the Navi that was killed in the base of Mikdash. And Yehoyahare Gimishkan Hashem coined the Navi. But what happened? Why was his Tochacha not accepted? And the Pasuk says, that when he spoke to the people, he says, Me'al ha'am, from above the people, not mitoch ha'am. And the Rishibah Zetzal pointed out that first of all, Zechariah was a Navi. You don't get to be a Navi just like that. If you're familiar with Sefer Mesidus Yisharim, you know it's based on the Brice of Rapinchas Ben Yorin. He talks about all the levels that it takes to achieve Ruach HaKodesh. Zehirus and Zerizus and Nikios and Prishus and Chasidus and Tara and Yerushchet, Hanova. All these things, and that leads you to Ruach HaKosh, that's still not a Navi. So Zechariah ben Yehud accomplished all of that. So please don't tell me that he was me'alam, he was arrogant. But what it must mean was that at some slight, barely perceptible level, there was some feeling in there that the Pasuk defines as me'alam. So why does that make a difference? The words he were delivering was the words of Nevoah. It's the message from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He didn't make it up. 
So he's saying all the right things. And he's saying it for all the right reasons. But there is something there, and it made a difference. People somehow picked it up. So Rabbi Naiman was able, of course, to feed Madrek Hussein. I'm not suggesting he matches the Chariya ben Yoyada, but to a very significant extent, his message got through because there was the love, the feeling of companionship, of being together with us. Not me'ala'am, but mitoka'am, at the same time that it could be tough and demanding. As I mentioned, he was tough and demanding, yet very sensitive. I recall a mice that happened when I was in his shir. Rabbi Naiman did not believe in social promotions. He went to his shir. You didn't get to the blatcher until he thought you were ready. And it didn't necessarily take one year. Some people had to stay longer, a year and a half, a year and change. There was a fellow in the shir who was really you know, not, he was very weak. And he was in the shir already two full years when I joined the shir. And he was still not doing well. And he was a little bit uh, depressed. And he came into Shir, he was very quiet, he had his head down, didn't say a word. Rabbi Naiman used to call on you. You, know, you had your day, you had to speak, and he'd let him get away with almost nothing. You know, he would say two words and he would go on. This was going on for a good solid two months. And one day after two months, there was some question that was being asked in the Shir, and he said, a, tried to propose an answer. I gotta tell you, the answer was so bad that some fellows in the shir actually started laughing. It wasn't me. This boy looked like he was looking for a hole in the ground to crawl into. Here he was two months, he didn't say a word, he finally says a word and this is what happened. Rabbi Naiman, like without missing a beat, pushes his chair back, leans against the wall and starts laughing uproariously, absolutely hysterically. There's shocked silence in the room. What's going on? Everyone's staring at him. And in his inimitable way, we won't say the real name, Rabbi Osai, for obvious reasons. Says, Chaim Yankel is saying lumdus, and the boys are laughing. This is hysterical. Repeat what you said. So he repeated what he said. It sounded just as ridiculous the second time as the first time, but this time nobody's laughing. Rabbi Naiman had this thing, he had a big tape recorder, and whenever somebody said something good, he would turn on the tape and say it over into the tape. He puts on the tape, Chaim Yankel is saying, he basically repeated exactly what he said. And it didn't make any sense. So then people started asking, but how does this answer the question? I said, don't you get it? Said, no. So he said, well, you're saying this, and he started adding like a little piece you know, to what it was. I don't think anybody even really picked it up. For three days, we're discussing Chaim Yankel's pshat in the Tosis. By the end of the three days, I realized that it had absolutely no resemblance to what he said in the first place. Little by little, he was adding and subtracting, adding and subtracting. Nobody knew. Like, and it was little piece by piece. And he felt like a million dollars. That this, you ask him to say over Chaim Yankel's pshat, I doubt he could have done it. Such a reaction on the spot. Nothing else would have worked. How did you get that from? Because he had a tremendous ava. I'm demanding, it's tough, but it's tough love. There's an ava there. My brother, Rabbi Naiman, mentioned how, the Rosh Hash, how uh, Rabbi Naiman Zetzal was so devoted to the Rosh Hashiva. I mentioned how he built up his shir. He did many things like that. It wasn't that simple, though. Rabbi Naiman was capable of challenging the Rosh Hashiva ferociously. I've seen it. How could you do that? What are you talking about? You know, there's a Ramban in Bamidbar. There's an episode towards the end of David HaMelech's reign where there was a... Um, David HaMelech uh, counted Klal Yisrael directly, instead of using the Maxis HaShekel. As a result of that, there was a Magefa, a Yomer, David, a God, Tsar, Li, Ma'od, Nipl, Nabiyad, Hashem, Ki, Rabin, Rachamov. And Chazal discuss how could it be that David could make such a mistake, and it says it was really Hashem caused it because of this chait, that chait, okay. But there is no mention in Chazal why Klal Yisrael suffered. 
the faith. Everything a Kodesh Baruch Hu does works out for everybody. So David had his faith. Why did the Jews, why did the people deserve a Magefa? So Rashi says, I don't know, Lois Parish, it's not explained. The Ramban says, Yitachen, Lomar, it's possible to say that the reason why there was a Magefa in Klal Yisrael is because they were responsible for the delay in building the base on Mikdash. Why? David HaMelech wanted to build the base on Mikdash. <clears throat> he was told by the Navi he can't do it because whatever the reasons, David was involved in war, his hands were, were, were in blood, and the base on Mikdash is peace. So he can't do it, rather his son would do it. But that's because it was David HaMelech's initiative, says the Ramban. But if it would have been the initiative of the people of Kal Yisrael, then they would have built the base on Mikdash. Kal Yisrael doesn't have such a problem. So there's a taina on them. Why didn't you initiate the building of the base on Mikdash? What does that mean? Here I am, an average Jew. I have a farm in Yehuda or the Galil, a boat in Zavulun, whatever. There's a king in Kal Yisrael, David HaMelech, a tzaddik, Ruch HaKodesh. There are Nevi'im. There's a Sanhedrin. Exactly how am I going to build a base on Mikdash? As a private citizen? I can't do it. You need the king. You need the Sanhedrin. You need the Nevi'im. And they're doing a very good job. They know what's right. They know what's wrong. So if a base on Mikdash needs to be built, won't they take care of it? So what does that have to do with me? And if I wanted to build a base on Mikdash, there's anything I could do? Yeah, I'll tell you what you could do. You could discuss it with your friends <clears throat> and see if they agree with you. And if they think it's a good idea, you'll go to your local Rav and say, you know, we were thinking, maybe we should build a base on Mikdash. You know, we already had, got rid of Amalek, there's a king, there's this, you know, time for a base of Mikdash. Rose said, you know what? It sounds like you have a point. Let me go to the local Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin Katanos. And if people were doing this all over the country, then the members of the local Sanhedrin would say, you know what? It sounds like a good idea. And they'd come to Yerushalayim and talk to the Sanhedrin Gedola, talk to the Melech, talk to the Nevi'im. And then they would come and turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Maybe they'd be shawl the room with Tumim, or they would ask a Nabi and say, you know, the people are, are, are tumulting, and they're suggesting that we should build a base of Mikdash. Then the answer would have been yes. So that means a private citizen sitting in his farm, knowing full well that we have Gedole, Yisrael, Nevi'im, Tzadikim, Talmidei Chachamim, running Klal Yisrael, has to worry about base of Mikdash, about all the Klal Yisrael. As the way the Rishiva put it one time when he said this, he says, you never have a heter to turn off your brain. This was the Midah. He was, he was loyal, subservient, machnia to the Rosh Yeshiva. He didn't turn off his brain. And I can't tell you the details. That's the real juicy part. But Rishiva told me at one point in time that twice that he re recalled, Rabbi Naiman, he said, prevented him from making a very serious mistake in the Anhaga of the Yeshiva. He was ready to do something, and Rabbi Naiman insisted and fought him, and he backed down. And twice he said that, that he felt that he's, the Lushan he used was that he saved the Yeshiva. So, yeah, there was hachna, there was loyalty, but don't fight too. How do you do that? How, how do you become such an Eved, so to speak, and you build him up, and, and the biggest thing in the world is we're going to go here, the Rosh Hashim is pilpushing, and then you fight him. On, on, on policy, not on, not stam a kash on toast to terrorists, I'm asking a kash to get an answer. No, we shouldn't do this. It's a paradox, but it's doable. So what's the message to us? I'm not saying that we could exactly duplicate that, I don't think so, but we can emulate. I think really the message to us is that where, where, how do you get there? What do you do? It comes from that uncompromising devotion to Torah, to Musr. That's what changes a person. That's what elevates a person. And that's what enables him to pick up on these subtleties and these contradictory forces and balance things. It doesn't come from anything else. And that devotion to Torah and mitzvahs, that devotion to being an Eved Hashem, as my brother-in-law said, enables us to accomplish things that through simple seichel would seem beyond us. So I hope we could take away a little bit of inspiration and to perhaps grow ourselves a little bit. 
I get a little bit closer to that true Torah personality that he was, and each and every one of us can accomplish that in some degree. Like we say, Kodesh Baruch doesn't want us to be anything more than what we could do, but he doesn't want us to be anything less than what we can do also. So if we do that, certainly if we are inspired to do that, it will be a schus for the nifter, and Bez Hashem, we should be zolcha to the Gili uh, Shechina, to be as Goel, to the time when the uh, sorrows are erased, Ubila Hamavas Lanetzach, and Yehei Zichra Baruch. I would now like to call upon the Rosh Hashiva, Rav Luban Shlita. My Grumblat, Sibor. There's a Pasig in the beginning of Kohel as Ein Zikron Rishonim. There is no memory to the earlier people, earlier generations, the Gamlach Reinim, and even not to the later ones, Sheyil Yilam Zikaram. And the Medrash, the Akad Shimoni, brings Pshat that human nature is people very quickly forget. There were many, the Medrash brings, there were many gedolim, sadikim. People forget so many gedolim, adore even. I used to hear about from different people. You speak to some Bakram today, they never even heard of them. They don't know they existed. And it's human nature to forget. But apostle, the Medrash says, but Akash Baruch Hu doesn't forget. And obviously, Akash Baruch Hu remembers and gives schar and ayam haba and everything. Shem doesn't forget. But human nature, people forget. And I think that if this is true in life in general, as a Rebbe, I think that any Rebbe will tell you that this is definitely one of the fates of Rabbeim, that you know, we work hard, at least I think so. They uh, dedicate it, hopefully. And nature is, you have a Talmud, it's in your shear for a year, and then the Talmud moves on, moves on to another shear, another shear, he has another Rebbe, and they forget. You forget the Talmud, perhaps, and the short, for sure the Talmud forgets you. Maybe you're lucky, you get an invitation five years later in the mail. Oh, he's getting married. Okay, very nice. But basically, the human nature, and that's Teva Ha'ilam, is people have busy lives, get involved in new things, person gets a new rabbi, continues, and you forget. And what I think what's amazing about Rabbi Naiman, I know myself, I was Rabbi Naiman Shear over 40 years ago, and you know, I think many other people here likewise, and people don't forget. It's not just that we quote him, there are certain key lines that I quote from Rabbi Naiman all the time. Einstein will never understand Chazaka. Whenever there's, there's all these key lines Rabbi Naiman used to say that we're always quoting every so often. But the, in general, the hashpa, and it's a shtick of Chiddush, because the Maisa, as far as it's, it's hard to explain the nature of the yeshiva in Queens, but in a certain sense, the yeshiva you know, you, you, you went to Rosh Hashiva's share, the yeshiva, the yeshiva had a very rigid system. No one else was allowed to say shmuzim, no one else was allowed to talk hashkafa. So once you left Rabbi Naiman share, it would seem that you weren't that much connected with him. Okay, he was a paisik in the yeshiva, you asked his shyness. But it's still a plea, to me it's a plea. How is it that after so many years, by myself, it's 40 years more, and others too. People feel connected to Rabbi Naiman. I say without 
Chas V'shad, I'm saying negative. And other Rebbein, definitely strong. No, myself, there's a stronger connection to Rebbein than some other Rebbein who also, you know, I remember I had wonderful years and they were probably changed my life in the incredible hashpa. But somehow they become forgotten. And I think, it's hard to say, but I think there was perhaps a point about Rabbi Naiman that made him unique. And obviously, some of what I'm going to say was said already. There is a Das Kane of Bawi Taisis in the beginning of Vayera. It's basically a Rashiva Shmu, so it's a slight variation. That we know it says, Vayera Beiloni Mamre. That Akash Baruch Hu came to Avram Avinu at the Eloni Mamre. And Rashi brings, why? What's the Mamre? Rashi brings the Chazal, that he gave the Eitzah for the Mila. What does that mean? He gave the Eitzah. So the Das Kainim says as follows. Tover Acher. Kishetziva Akash Baruch Hu limo ko anche beiso. When Akash Baruch Hu gave the Tziva to Avram, to not just Mao himself, but also to Mao all the members of his household. So he asked his people that he trusted for advice. How can you get the people in his household to agree with the Mila? They don't agree. Avram Avinu was stuck. Amazing thing. Avram Avinu went ahead and fought the whole world. Avram Avinu was mashpi on the whole world. Avram Avinu was the nevesh asher asu b'charin. He, he made a revolution. He convinced everybody, so many hundreds, thousands of people to change their whole lifestyle, to become religious. But to convince them to do bris milah, it seems he couldn't get them to agree. And these were the people, these were his Talmudim Pashtas. These are Anche Beso Pashtas, are the ones that he, were, he was successful to much beyond. But he couldn't, Chris Mila, such a foreign thought. They couldn't convince him. So Avraham was dumb. And then Veshko was dumb. Holach Eitzel Mamre. So he went to Mamre, and Mamre gave an Eitzah. What was the Eitzah? The advice, he should get Brismita himself, first get the Brismita himself, and when people see, if you lead the way, you do it, forget about all the speeches, forget about all the Torahs, just do it, people will see you do it, and they'll follow. And it's an amazing chazal of the kayach of an example, of a kayach atzir, of a person who leads the way. All of Avram's speeches, all of Avram's pikras, all of Avram's chassidkas, his, 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 his lomdas, could not convince the people to get a bris mila. But if he just does it, and they see it doesn't seem, just, just do it, and then they'll follow. You see, look, look, how, look, I did it. You can do it too. And I think a large extent that was what made Rabbi Naiman so special in the yeshiva. The yeshiva that saw was perhaps the general, was the Aram Avino. Yeshiva had it literally with Megai or Geirim. He took the Bokrim that had perhaps no shaykhs to be in Torah. Surely no shaykh is to spending the whole lives in yeshiva. You know, the guys who came into Rabbi Naiman's share was a joke. They all went by their English names. Rabbi Naiman was mocked, he called the guys by their Hebrew names. I remember, there's a, one, a person in uh, one of our heads of one of our branches, I still remember, Rabbi Naiman used to always call him Simcha. The guy never responded, Simcha. <laughs> Fine, it took like uh, those who know what I'm talking about. So, Ten minutes, you know, until you would realize, it's, oh, you're talking about me? <laughs> no one ever called him Simcha. We, we had a lorry, and he's a, he's a head somewhere else, and a Simcha, and a, but whatever it was, a Steve, they were, but these were the guys that came to the yeshiva, and yeshiva with his hashba changed them. But he needed a kaya chatzir. He needed a living example. And Rabbi Naiman was a living example, I think, in the yeshiva, 
of what it meant to be a Talmud of the yeshiva, an American born, as was mentioned. Somehow the yeshiva was different. She was from Europe. She was just brilliant. Shiva was just a different world. You know, you, certain things that were Shiva was like you couldn't relate to. But Rabbi Naiman was, as mentioned, was a re regular American person. He was a born, and he went ran through the yeshiva. He was a Talmud of the yeshiva, and he was a living example that you would look at and say, this is what the yeshiva stands for. Here's a finished product. The truth is there weren't that many finished products at Chavetz Chaim in those years. We didn't see so many. But he was a perfect example. And that, I think, was an essential ingredient of the success of the yeshiva. And that's why I think the guys throughout their years, when you weren't in Rabbi Naim and Shir, Later on, people would ask, I mean, I was also the place like yeshiva, you can say connected as shaivas, but besides which, he was the walking example of what the yeshiva stood for. It was mentioned many of the points, I just want to perhaps repeat over. There's a chazal that says that when Moshe went up to Har Sinai, so the Pesach says that Yeshua went with him. So Rashi says, so at the end of Mishpatim, I don't know why, well, Yadati, don't know why, what's Yeshua doing here? So Raji says his father, said Yeshua was Malav, his Rebbe. His Rebbe is going up to our Sinai, so you accompany him. It's proper Derek Heretz. Then it got to a point where Moshe had to go up himself, and Yeshua wasn't allowed to go. So what does Yeshua do? do? The Yeshua not the Shem Oado. Yeshua put his tent there. Then it's Akesham called Mem Yom. And he waited there for 40 days. Because he says, Rashi says, you look at the Psukim, when the Pilei were doing the Cheda Ego, and Yomosha comes down, and Yoshua says that there's some noise in the Macha. He didn't know what was going on. So obviously, Yoshua stayed by the bottom of the mountain for 40 days. He didn't go back to the camp. And it's a plea. I think people ask, why not? They, Yeshua knew that Moshe was going to be up in Har Sinai for 40 days. Everyone knew. But Rashi himself says the reason for the Cheta Ego, because they calculated the 40 days was over. So everyone knew that Moshe was going up to Har Sinai 40 days. So why don't you go back? What are you waiting here for? Go home. Huh? You have a wife? You know, you have kids? What, what, are you, what are you staying here for? And it's not like it was so far. I mean, obviously, the noise carried. I don't think the machna of Kaisro from our Sinai, I don't know, half hour, a quarter of an hour, there was no traffic you had to worry about on the midboard. Like, go, what, what's the big deal? You, what, you're nervous. You're afraid you're going to miss motion when it comes down. So go back home for 38 days, 39 days, on the 40th day. You want to make sure you're early. Come a day earlier and come back. Why in the world is Yahshua sitting 40 days by the waiting, all alone, sitting there. So I don't exactly have the answer, but I think it's a hard gosha. When your Rebbe goes up to Har Sinai, and you, this is your life, Moshe Rabbeinu is my life, I, I can't go home. I'm waiting for Moshe. It, it's not logical. It doesn't make a difference, but hargoshes aren't always logical. It's a hargosha. I can't do something else. I, this is, I have to wait. Moshe, Moshe's there, right? I'm, I'm going to go away? I'm going to leave Moshe? He doesn't know. Moshe doesn't know if I'm sitting here. He doesn't know when I'm sitting here. But I, I can't leave. I can't go away. I have to sit there and waiting. And that was Rabbi Naiman had, as was mentioned by everybody, such a tremendous dveikis to the Rosh Hashiva. I remember, you know, when I first came to Rabbi Naiman, Rabbi Naiman spoke about how lucky we are that our yeshiva is run by a gado. And he, you know, such a discussion of what it meant to have a gado running the yeshiva. He also, I remember when I was in the shir, he tried to get the whole shir to go to the Pilpo shir. The Maisa by, by me, it didn't work. Well, the guys didn't go. They took the day off. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. I think what happened, if I remember, I mean, I even had his vote if he wanted to go to the Pilpo shir. And I voted against going because I wanted to have regular share. Everybody else voted to have the Pope share, and then they all didn't show up. <laughs> it's been, okay. But the Maisa, 
That's, but the Ma'is of Rabbi Naim was definitely the, you felt such a connection to the Rosh Hashiva, as was mentioned, if you were in the Rosh Hashiva, Rosh Hashiva, Rosh Hashiva spoke Hashkafa, so you had to write it down for him. You had someone in the share in the blotcher, that was his job. Anytime there's hashkafa, you had to write it down. There was after every sugya in the blotcher. There was, you had to say over the tape of the sugya. I don't know how many sugyas I said over. Other people said over. When we finished the sugya, you had to make a tape of the whole sugya from beginning to end. Every, you know, any word that Rashiva said was, was, was precious. He had to record it. Also, other gedolim. I mean, I mean, used to go to Ramosha was mentioned. He had a seder. I remember sitting in the base manager's learning one day, and Rabbi Naiman sits down next to us. Well, I heard from Ramosha, and I think Rabbi Naiman told us he heard from Rabbi Scheinberg that if you hear something, you want to make sure you remember it. You have to say it over to three times. So he had a he was mocked, when he came back from Ramosha, he would sit down, go to three different chavrusas and tell them over what Ramosha said. So that the week was my lucky week. He, would, he came over, and you know, it's out of the blue. He sat down. Okay, I heard the following Kiddush. He told me what Ramosha said, and then he moved on to the next group he's going to tell. But he had such a chashivas. It was known anyone who had a chasana and a godo, especially Ramosha of Yaakov, was coming to the chasana. Rabbi Naiman had the right to drive them. I don't think he drove them himself. I assume he got someone else to drive them. And he sat in the back with them. But that was, he had the, the chazaka. He was always running after Gedodim. But especially, especially the Rosh Hashiva. And if definitely, the, the, if there was any, you know, the, you know the, the, what, what made Chavetz Chaim unique was definitely the chashivas that the Talmidim gave to Rosh Hashiva, the way they worked on every shear and every shmooz and it was, you know, it's un, what's unheard of in the Torah world, the amount of time. If I told people how much time we spent on the Pilpul share, it would be, be almost embarrassing. And part of it, obviously, Rashiva could not generate that totally by himself. I think Rashiva did, to some extent, he, you know, he emphasized he's going to make you a lamdin. In every beginning of every sugya, there was always the first day of a pep talk. But a large part of it was that you had the seer chushi. You had the living example of seeing Rabbi Naiman's total bittel, the total chashivas, to every single word that the Rashiva said. It had to be tape recorded, it had to be catalyzed. It was, he was so much of it that it carried over to everyone else. And everyone else in the yeshiva developed the same chashivas. There's the second Mida I wanted to talk about on t- too much. There's a Pasuk, I believe the Shiva said this at a hesped on the, shlo- on the yard site for Rav David. There's a Pasuk in, in uh, Tehillim. Nara Yisi Vigam Sakanti Velori Yisi Sadik Nezav. Vizarum of Akish So it's in the, really the Mikdash Ma'at brings it from a Riva that what do you mean? How's it kasha? How can you say Rode Isi Sadik Nezov? Maybe it's not common, but there have been documented cases of Sadikim who seem to have had saris, Sadikim who seem to be poor. There were cases. So how can they, the 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 Tehillim say Rode Isi Sadik Nezov? I never saw. So the he answered, it's Lore Isi. Of course, there were cases of a tzaddik who maybe had it very difficult. But lo re'isi, you never saw it because the tzaddik never let it, let it show. The tzaddik was always so happy with his situation that you couldn't tell. There was no way of knowing. There was no way of knowing. If they didn't have food, you had no way of knowing. Because he was walking around with the biggest smile, you wouldn't know. That's what Rashiva said about Rav David, that Rav David had tremendous sorrows, tremendous poverty in the yeshiva. There were days, he said, remember saying, there was mamish, no food in the house. And he was always smiling. I think Rashiva said he remembers one time when David got a little, well, stop smiling for a minute. <laughs> Told him, but it's not for now. But there was, he was basically always happy. And that was, I think, something you saw about Rabbi Naiman, as was mentioned before, the Rabbi Naiman, had Pia and Hara, a large family. 
The yeshiva was not known, the Chavetz Chaim in Queens was not known for paying a very high salary. I cannot tell you what their shita now is. I'm not, it's a new administration. I don't know. But in, my, in those days, the yeshiva was known as the hashkafa was that the more money, if you have a higher budget, it means that the yeshiva has to do more fundraising. Who's going to do more fundraising? There is yeshiva. The yeshiva does more fundraising. We have less rosh yeshiva in the yeshiva. So the hashkafa was that it's better to cut corners and save money, and you have a better yeshiva because the yeshiva won't have to do fundraising, and you'll, you'll have the rich yeshiva. And the yeshiva cut corners everywhere. I remember I was the, the rich yeshiva secretary, and there was a big machlekes. There was a whole delegation of guys came to yeshiva that the minig of the yeshiva was that they got every day a delivery of fresh bread. So Rabbi Ginsburg, that's how was, he was charge of the finances. But Ginsburg used to take every day the fresh bread and put it in the freezer and take out yesterday's bread and serve it. And the guys would go, great. We're like, like, we're getting fresh bread. Why do we have to eat bread from the freezer? And Rabbi Ginsburg said, because if, you get, if I served the fresh bread, you would eat too much. It costs too much money. And the guys got so upset to get fresh bread. No, we have to serve, serve, eat day-old bread every day. And I, they went to Rashiva, and I think the Rashiva agreed by Ginsburg. I'm not sure. I don't remember who owned the Machlaikas. But that was how the Yeshiva ran. I remember the, there was the Yeshiva's dinners. If you remember the Yeshiva's dinners, where they used to be in the base medrash, we rolled out those round tables from the, from the dungeon, and the, there was, it was catered. You imagine a dinner. We, the Yeshiva, we have here a dinner, you know, we go to Para Jungle. There, the dinner was in the base medrash. They had these old tables that were stored in some storage room. They were round. With a very old, you probably could get a splinter if you touched them because they were all breaking. And the, the yeshiva self catered it. They could get from Meal Mart some food, it was a lava malka. The entertainment was the guys used to sing, the choir, the guys were the waiters. And that was the lava malka, the yearly big, the big fundraiser. And I remember, I don't know if it was at the, one of these, I don't remember when it was, but I remember. There was Rabbi Ginsburg also came over to a friend of mine and asked him to take pictures at one of these yeshiva dinners. Because he says, people like it when you take pictures. But don't put any film in the camera. It's too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that was what the yeshiva was. The, the yeshiva was mamish cutting corners. And I am sure, especially because I, was, I happened to have worked a little bit for the yeshiva in Queens, I was... When I was in as a Koda, I went to Eretz Yisrael, a little bit as a rabbi, and later. The yeshiva was very careful in the salary in those days. And I am sure that Rabbi Naaman's salary was, you know, as, not, you know I would say that, it this way, that as much as the rabbeim here complain, rightfully so, I'm sure he got less. So, so and yet, Rabbi Naiman was always happy, as was mentioned. He was always happy. That was Rabbi Naiman, his son said it so beautifully, quoting from Rabbi Harris. He, was, he used to learn Musser with his screaming, with a co. He was always happy. And even though, and, and I, once it was, a, to me it was a chiddish otzum. I didn't know, I guess, I assume the family knew, but I didn't know. I was the Rebbitson, that's how I once told me, that Ay, she feels so bad when she sees Rabbi Naiman. What she tell me? Why? Because she remembers that Rabbi Naiman used to be the best dressed guy in the whole yeshiva and the most stylish guy in the whole yeshiva. He was the, wore the newest styles of everyone in the yeshiva. He was the most, when he was in yeshiva, apparently his parents had money, and he was the most stylish guy in the whole yeshiva. And later years, he didn't dress shalom shalom, but you know, you could see he was not the best, most stylish guy in the whole yeshiva. So she felt bad, but Rabbi Naiman didn't feel bad. Rabbi Naiman, you got the, you got the, walked around with this tremendous simcha. And it, it's, you know, it's, it's especially a person who is used to growing up. I never knew that. It grew to his youth, all his years of being wealthy, you know, the, 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 the most, the stylish guy in the whole yeshiva. It's hard to imagine. I mean, I'm the most stylish guy in the whole yeshiva. That's what she told me. 
And then he goes ahead and he's, you know, he has to make do. He makes do. And whether it was, you know, making do, whatever you could see, but with always with simcha. I just recently saw, it was Siyata de Shemai, a statement from Rav Chatzke Levinson, one of his arm. I think just this week I was flipping the pages, and he says, Every Ben Taira, but it's not so easy to be a Ben Taira, is basically happier, has a more relaxing life than anybody else in the world. Ani Rikshafi, talking about himself, Vada I can definitely say on myself, that I lived a very good life. My life was better than other people. I didn't get any great pleasure, but I'll keep out the I didn't receive much of Ayyam Hazah. And this was something which we saw, the Talmudim saw in Rabbi Naim, and I think it had a tremendous effect without us even realizing it, because Rashiva was pushing our Batsas Torah, Batsas Torah. Oh, I can go into our Batsas Torah. Okay, you know, we know they're waiting for us, but they're not paying for it. So how are we going to go? So there you saw, you looked at Rabbi Naiman, and you saw it's doable. It's doable. You can be, you can go into our Batsas Torah, you can be happy, you can have a family, you can be... It, it, it was, it was a, a tremendous chizik, I believe, so that Rabbi Naiman served not only as a Rebbe, which he was a Rebbe par excellence, which he had all kinds of shtick, which was mentioned, you know, with all kinds of different shtick that he had in the shir, which made, you know, to get the guys learning. When I was in the shir, he gave me the job, which I don't know whether it was for myself, for him, I still don't know. I don't know if it's everywhere. I had to write up shir every day for him. He gave me a little notebook, and I had exactly four lines, and I had a concise share into four lines in the notebook. And I don't know if that notebook exists or doesn't exist, but he had all kinds of shtick guys had to write up. They had a little, little, these little Israeli notebooks that someone had to write up share every one a different day, and he had, everyone had to say over share, and he had, but he was an excellent Rebbe, but besides that, Besides being a Rebbe, and besides, as I mentioned, he was the Paisik of the Yeshiva, and besides what was mentioned was that he was a Mashkiach of the Yeshiva, and it was mentioned that he, yes, he definitely was uh, a little tough, and you know, there was definitely, was, all that was, is true, but he also meant, was what I believe he was a seer. We looked in the Yeshiva, we wanted to see what, what are we aiming for, what is the the, the future, what is the a product of the yeshiva looks like. He was at Seir Hushi, which gave the people the encouragement. We learned, we learned by, by Avram Avino, by the Bris Mila, that if he can do it, we can do it. He went ahead and he showed the way which inspired everyone else to do the same. Hashem, it should be a schus for the self, his family. Just want to conclude there's a Gemara in Menachas says we mentioned about that Yoshua's Hasmada so there's a Gemara in Menachas that says interesting Gemara it says that there's a Pasuk in the beginning of Yoshua uh, Yoshua Aleph La Yomish Sefer Torah Zemi Picha so Pashib Shad it's a tzivoy. So the Gemara Minoch says it's not a tzivoy, but it's a bracha. That Akash Baruch says, you, Yoshua, you have the Mida of Lo Yomish Mitocha Oel, so I give you a bracha that Lo Yomish Sefer Torah Zemi Picha. And what apparently from the Gemara it seems that even though Yoshua had this entire tr- tremendous drive of Lo Yomish Mitocha Oel, it wasn't so pushed to succeed at the end of the day of the Yomish Sefer Torah's Emi Picha. You need a special bracha, special siyata dishmaya, because there could be all kinds of distractions and who knows what that can be made. And Rabbi Naiman Tatsah was Zaycha, he had that tremendous drive of the Yomish Mitocha Oel, and he was Zaycha to the Yomish Sefer Torah's Emi Picha, and we sure he would give the bracha that should continue. But there's Harechon, and as we know, Baruch Hashem, the Son, 
We're here with Rashiva, the son-in-law, Rashiva in Queens. We know so many others. It's such a beautiful family. Almost everyone you meet is somehow related to the Naiman family. So, so you see that the, the tremendous bracha that they have received of Lo Yomish Sefer Torah Zemi Picha, and Hashem the bracha should continue to them and through to all Klai Israel. I'd like to now call upon the Rosh Hashiva, Harav Pelgon Shlita. Shus Rabbi Grumblat, Chashev Rashivas, Rabbanim, I see many older Talmidim than I, who were in Rebbe's Shir, who probably would do a better job presenting Rebbe's Zikoran. Marvel mentioned to the Yeshiva and Boka who are here with the Rashiva, Rebbeim. In preparing to speak for this Askara Lezecha Nishma Smari Rebbe, I was thrown back in time to literally my first year in the yeshiva in Queens, known fondly as Forest Hills. Rebbe was a very demanding mashkiach. He would assign each Talmud in the shir on a rotational basis. It was his turn, he had to say the Kiddush, as was mentioned. He taught us the concept, ain't based menish below Kiddush. And there's no such thing as any kind of meaningful Seder happening without some novel discovery in the Lumdus of Torah. You didn't dare come into Shir without something to say. You had to wiggle yourself out if you didn't come prepared. One Talmud who was unprepared, what's your Kiddush? My Kiddush is yesh base medrash below Kiddush. Each day, one of us was on the rotation. Saying a Kiddush in Torah is probably one of the most advanced levels of higher learning that exists. Yet Rebbe demanded that each of us, despite us being young, very typical American boys, learning was still not a given for most of us back then. I remember one of my chaverim trying to eke out a chiddush in sheer, but frankly was just rambling for about five or 10 minutes was finally rewarded with Rebbe's eyes lighting up, his hands raised up in victory, crediting him with being mechavin to the deepest pshat in Arishun. This would happen time and time again, day in, day out. He turned our novice superficial ramble into polished, in-depth Chedushi Torah that he later showed us printed 
in the ranks of Svarim of the highest pedigree. Some of us at times would cheat a bit and simply ramble without even a gallant attempt, hoping that Rebbe would once again, through his magic, somehow attribute his pshat to some Rabbi Hanan or a Baruch Ber. But Rebbe could tell after a couple of minutes of one of these obvious attempts, Rebbe simply looked at the Talmud and asked, have you said anything yet? Rebbe introduced us to the very depths of Ian. One of my chaverim reminded me last night that in the very first sugya, when we were in his shir, it was Baba Basra, Rebbe went through the entire sugya seven times, each time with a different shot in a rajba. And he held us responsible to know and say over each pshat with bechinus, tests, he would administer after each sugya. The bechinus took place over a couple of days, orally, one-on-one, -on -one, at all hours of the day and night in locations that would only have to be determined. One of us on his way to the car mechanic, myself, while clearing his garage in the back of the house, we became so personally close to Rebbe through these times. I remember while clearing his garage, for example, he told me that he has Masora from his father, that with good tires and frequent oil changes, one's car can last for dozens of years longer than they do. The shear was our window into all that existed in the yeshiva. When we said it over accurately, he would smile from ear to ear, find you a notepad to write it up, or the ultimate compliment, to record it on his recorder. If you're counting, there are only five pages. Rebbe kept three running recorders on his desk during the shear. One was used to record any question that anyone asked that was deemed worthy. Any shot offered, any general comment on the sugya that he wanted saved for posterity. The second was called the Ikrim tape, just for the yesodos that were bullet or bite-sized that would be available for a concise summary of the main fundamentals taught in that sugya. The third was his tape on Hashkafa, Yesode Hadas. If Hashkafa topic came up during Shir, and many did, his pressing the buttons to turn off one recorder and turn on the other recorder got many of us to wake up. You knew something good was about to come. I remember one particular day that got all of our ears. Rebbe said, and before I repeat this, I think it should be understood that the world is fast changing. It was 1980, it did not resemble what it is today. There was no Shidduch crisis that I was aware of. Chavetz Chaim had under 100 Talmidim. Lakewood barely had 1,000. Rebbe was attempting to gather as many Talmidim to stay in learning as possible. There, there was nobody else. So Rebbe said that day when the Hashkafa tape went on, there is no girl that's worth one year of learning. I remember the passion, the energy with which he said that. He said to us, even a girl who is, and I, I, I know the ladies section is here. 
He said to us, even a girl who is the biggest Yachsonis, the daughter of the greatest Gadol Hadar, makes no difference. Talmud Torah, Keneged Kulam. This gave us so much confidence. It esteemed the Torah in our eyes. We wanted more of it. After all, Rebbe just told us that our Torah, our seven pshatim in the Rajba, trumped the best girl. We were enamored. But it came at quite a price. Rebbe demanded hasmada. He expected you to come into Shir prepared, resolute, ready to fight on a Sfara or a Kasha in Shir. Rebbe had a way of letting you know if he felt you should be working harder, always with a touch of humor. One time, I remember he saw a bunch of us on a Friday shear, very sleepy, nodding off. He turned to one Talmud, I believe the only Talmud who was wide awake and fully participatory, and he said, Take a look around. What do you see? Talmud looked around and said, Rabbi, I see everyone sleeping. <laughs> That's not what I see. I see a band of Talmudim who were steiging on Thursday night learning, working on Ian, maybe Shev Schmeitzer. They're obviously exhausted. Look at you fully awake and engaged like it's Monday morning. What's your problem? <laughs> Everyone chuckled, but they understood what Rebbe meant. Rebbe pushed us to feel we were elite, ready to speak in learning on any sugya with anyone and everyone. He pushed us to converse with the Gedolim. By example, he demonstrated this at every chasana. He would have prepared questions to speak to them. If you were going anywhere where he thought you would meet up with a Gadol, he would stop preparing a list for you to ask. Nobody told Rebbe they were going to a chasana. <laughs> One time I remember him asking me, where do I daven when I go home for Shabbos? I told him this shul, that shul. Sometimes I go to my old high school, Kamenetz. He asked me, do you speak in learning with Reb Levi Krepenya? Is that all? I told him, Rebbe, I was in the yeshiva for six years. I, I never said a word to him. He rebuked me, telling me I had a chiv, an obligation to talk and learning with my Rosh Hashiva. And indeed, I could not refuse Rebbe. That Shabbos, I overcame my fear, and I approached Rev Kapenya Zatzal to discuss the sugya of Ede Machishim, the Aflam Ra'al from Beis and Chesk Sabatim, Machokis Rav Huna Rav Chizda. To this day, that sugya is clearer in my mind because of the preparation I had to put in to have that conversation with Rabbi Levi Krepenya Zatzal due to Rebbe's prodding. My chavar told me last night, I called him, he says there was one Sunday morning that it was dark, he was sleeping in the dorm, and Rebbe was shaking him. It was before 6 a.m. Binyamin, you have a driver's license? He says, yeah, yes, Rebbe. He was literally clearing his eyes. I, I just became 18, and I, I got my license two weeks ago. Rebbe said, good enough. We need to pick up Rav Shimon Eider. 
We have to meet Rabbi Bluth at MTJ. We're having a session with Moshe. It was well known. Rabbi had a weekly Sha'as and Shuvah session with Rabbi Moshe. My Chavar said it was the very first time he ever drove on the highway. <laughs> Rabbi all the time telling him he's such a great driver. He was barely awake. Rabbi, through his personal example, taught us how to be a Tamil, how to be a Talmud. His Anivas knew no bounds when it came to the Rosh Hashiva, Zatzal. It was remarkable. I, I know it was mentioned already. Even after having hundreds of his own Talmidim, he openly and blatantly would run to the Rosh Hashiva's Musashmuz. He would, wouldn't wait for anyone to get him a chair. He would carry a chair, if he didn't see one, to the closest Dalit Amas that existed physically to the Rashiva. He would take out a notebook and pen, and like a first year Bacher, he would write down the Musashmus. He put us all to shame. The way Rebbe was Machnia himself to the Rashiva was absolutely not believable. Chazal say, Ezeu Oshir Asameach Bechalko. We tend to think that this applies only to physical wealth. Rebbe had plenty of spiritual wealth. He was giving one of the highest level shirim in any base medish in America. Varan Cutler Zatzal himself. Rebbe had told us, had recruited him to come to Beis Menesh Kavoa after talking and learning with him. He was the post in yeshiva that was, was mentioned. He had weekly sessions with our Moshe Feinstein, the Godel Adar. At some point, one would think that such a person can stop playing the Talmud. And as we know the entire yeshiva centered around the Rosh Yeshiva, Satsal. Not only did Rebbe never interfere with that, not only did he help encourage Bachrim and Avrechim and Kolo to nurture their relationship with the Rosh Yeshiva, but he himself continued to cultivate his Rebbe Talmud relationship with the Rosh Yeshiva. It requires a mid of Sameach Bechelko. He cherished the Avodas HaKodesh that he was doing with total humility and anivas. I heard the Hespid given last week in Eretz Yisrael by Rabbi Welcher, a very close Talmud of Rebbe, a good 10, maybe more years before me. He took this point even a step further. In the mid to late 1960s, the Rashiva, who was a Gavaldika visionary, was giving lofty shmuzim of our Batsas Torah. Through the eyes of the Chazal, he would forecast a blueprint for what he would spend his lifetime building. The network of branches that we know about today mostly came about towards the end of the Rashiva's lifetime. One branch opened up in the mid-1970s. I may not be exactly right. A couple more in the 80s, including Milwaukee and Miami. Rabbi Welcher noted that it was Rebbe's ability to bring the Rashiva's vision to the Talmidim in ways that they could understand and relate to. That is what helped bring the Rashiva's dream to reality. Without Rebbe, and this is Rabbi Welcher saying it, it's hard to know if the Rashiva's vision would have come to, to fruition as it did. This took tremendous anivus, humility, the deher, what his tafkid in life was, and he never veered off. After Rebbe's patira, a Misa that demonstrated such tremendous anivis, which I was present at, took place. I don't believe I ever told this story to the Mishpacha. At my chasana, the Rashiva Zatzal was Masada Kedushin. 
due to the Rosh heavy schedule and achrayas. Rebbe, as he did with everyone, did all the legwork, making sure all the kibudim were in place, and in short, organized everything from soup to nuts that Achasa needed. To be mechabed Rebbe properly, I had arranged for him to be honored with Kriyas Ksuba, which is presumed to be the, the second covered offered. When Rebbe came to the Hasana, he came running over to me. I see Rabtuvia Goldstein, Zatal. One of the Zikni Adar is here. Indeed, I said. My father-in-law's Rebbe. Hmm, he said. I think I will defer the covet of Kriyas Aksuva to Reptuvia. So I said, okay, when Rebbe says he thinks, when does Rebbe want to decide? So he says, first, I will need to ask the Rosh Shiva. I was struck. I remember at the Kabbalah's Panim. Imagine. He didn't even authorize himself to defer to Reb Tuvia Goldstein. Perhaps accepting a lesser covered would somehow be a dishonor to the yeshiva. And he told me he needed to check with the yeshiva first. And indeed, he deferred to Reb Tuvia. And I moved Rebbe to the covered of Brachachrita, which I presume to be the third cover that was offered. When my Manal from high school was called up as one of the Ede Kedushin, the usual questions, are you related to the Chasun or Kala, was asked. And it was determined under the chuppah that my Manal from high school, his wife, was second cousins with my mother-in-law. It seemed irrelevant to me, but that short conversation came out under the chuppah. You know, you always want to know what they're talking about under the chuppah. Well, that's what was going on in my chasana. Rebbe postled my manal as an aide, something my manal probably would have done when I was in high school. He postled them as an aide under my chuppah. And he announced under the chuppah to us that I will be the aid. I'm not related. I will be the aid. When the kibbutz of Bracha Chrita was about to be announced, Rabbi Naiman ran over, ran to the bacher that was calling out the kibbutzim, and he instructed him to call up my manal for the Bracha Chrita. After the chuppah, some of my chaverim came over to me, dumbfounded, incredulous, asked me, why did I give my menahal so many kibudim and had forgotten to give Rabbi Naaman not one covered? Rabbi Naaman was not called up to any kibud to that chuppah. The tremendous anivus. I wanted to close with one schmooze that Rebbe himself said when he was being honored by the RSA dinner that I flew in for approximately 10 years ago. The Pasuk in Parshish Vayetze says, Vayikatz Yaakov Mishnaso Vayomar Ochen Yesh Hashem Bamokam Hazer Vanochi Lo Yadati. Yaakov got up from his sleep and he said, I see that there is Hashem in this place and I didn't know. Zakta Seforno, She'ili Yadati, because had I known, Hayisi Mechin Atzbi Lenavua, I would have prepared myself for prophecy, Velo Kain Asisi. Regretfully, I did not. I did not prepare myself. Rebbe noted, Number one, Yaakov was on such a high madrega. He had kvitas haderech. 
HaKadosh Baruch Hu performed open miracles for him. Number two, he had just finished learning Yeshiva Shem Ve'ever for 14 years. The Medrash says in those 14 years, Yaakov Avinu did not sleep for 14 years. Rebbe asked, how could Yaakov feel he needed more preparation than this? What would he have done? And Rebbe answered, apparently, you can be exposed to all the Ruchnias, but without knowing what you're receiving, it's difficult. And Rebbe implored the Bachrim to dehair what they're receiving from the yeshiva. And as much as you're gaining, you could gain a little bit more. Rebbe lived this shmuz. The zrizas he exercised was unparalleled. He was always running to the next event. He probably lived at least two lifetimes, maybe three, of someone his age. I watched the Mishnayas and Sfarim he devoured, he completed, just on Yom Kippur. I sat right across from him. Just the Sfarim he completed during break times, being Gavra le Gavra, was amazing. He always personified this idea of Yesh Hashem B'makam Hazeh. May his neshama be a melitz yosher for his mishpacha. It is well known how close he felt to us here in Miami. He was in fact on our, on our hanhala. He gave shir before our dinner season. May his life's work be a schus for all his talmidim. The line that always was says that Rebbe built all the branches. May his schus be to all the branches that he truly built. Ad bias Mashiach Meherav Yamenu. Amen. Our final speaker tonight is a Rebbe in our base Medrash in our high school and a very close Talmud of Rebbe Neumann Zetzal. I would now like to call upon Rebbe Kalter. Thank you. Rishusa, Russia Yeshiva. After listening to everybody, I really don't have much to add. Uh, although there probably is uh, with, with a great man like Rabbi Nyman. I, I do want to mention, by the way, you know, I think with a standard of postling a second cousin of a mother in law, in the future at a Chavetz Chaim wedding, there will be no kosher Aiden. <laughs> Um, I just want to maybe in some way, uh, there are many personal interactions, and address a little bit what Rabbi Louvain uh, mentioned, that the incredible lasting impact that Rabbi Nyman has had on his Talmudim. And I think that one of the reasons for that or there are two components to it. One reason is that, as was mentioned, he was a role model, but more than a role model, but the image in your mind, what you can envision, the memories go way beyond anything he said, but the way he said it. His very being, his very essence, was 100% absolute total dedication to the Talmidim, to the yeshiva, to the Rosh Yeshiva, and Lahagdil Torah V'yadir. It wasn't just words. Every single one of his actions, his movements, represented that, was committed to that. And, and we saw that. And those pictures, 
as much as the words, more than the words, I think are so deeply embedded. For example, mentioned Rabbi Nyman is mashkiach, but the pain on his face when he saw that we weren't learning spoke volumes. It wasn't a show, it wasn't an act. Torah going down the drain? You finished your coffee, what are you still doing here? The pain, the It was so sincere, it was so meaningful, it spoke such volumes about the terrible tragedy of Bittal Torah without any speeches. The, the, there's an interesting Mordechai that asks a question about a famous mice of Hillel. There was a guy who came to Hillel he had heard about the big day kahuna, sounded pretty impressive, and he decided that, uh, you know, I should convert, and maybe I could become a Kohen Gadol, and I'll get to wear all those fancy clothes. Well, of course, the Gemara says, you know, Shammai said goodbye, have a nice life, and he goes to Hillel, and Hillel talks to him, his Makarov, and takes him into the yeshiva, and he becomes a Ger MS, uh, even realizing that, uh, guess what? You're not going to become a Kohen Gadol. So the Mordechai asks an obvious question. Fine, Anivus, you want to be nice, but we're not looking for Gerim, you know. So he says, he must have noticed something. With it all, he must have noticed that there was a real desire to, ta to come, Tachas Kanfei Ashrina. So what does that have to do with Anivus? Oh, very perceptive. That's the essence, one of the most obvious, and this was also mentioned, manifestations of Anivus. I'm here to listen because I'm interested in what you need, what you want, what can I do for you? It's when we listen, which very often is, what does he want from me? <laughs> that we don't hear what the person really needs. It's only when we listen with that ear of, if he's coming to me, he needs something that I can give that person. And that was the anivus manifested by Hillel's ability to perceive, besides the veneer of wanting to put on the fancy uh, big day kahuna, there really was some essence of really wanting to come tachas kan feyashrina. Again, the vision, and it's all, like I say, I don't have much new to say. But what I'm saying is, what sticks in my mind is that picture of Rabbi Nyman listening intensely. Whether he was listening intensely to a Talmud, whether it was in learning, whether it was a problem, whether it was listening to the Rosh Hashiva, listening, such concentration, such focus, tremendous ability to move from one thing to another with focus, 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 listening. I have to know what you're saying. I have to hear what you're saying. Uh, also, that's just another little knech, Rabbi Luban mentioned the Rav David's famous vort on uh, of Nar um, Yisi Gamza Kanti. I'd like to give it a little spin to Rabbi Nyman's, you know, people mention he worked so hard, but if you looked at him, you wouldn't say that he was working hard. Yeah, obviously that glint in his eye, that smile that exuded Simcha Sechayim. But besides that, you, you saw an active, not wasting one moment individual, but he never looked like he was working hard. I think the vort is that when one has imbibed internalized the Midah of Zrizos to the degree to which he did, and I think the Mesilla Shishara mentions that you're light as a feather. You're just moving, you're just going. Light as a feather because there's a new energy, there's a spiritual energy that drives the person. Again, that vision, it's just the picture. That picture worth a thousand words, just seeing Rabbi Nyman move, go from one thing to another. 
and, and, and nonstop. And it was all Torah. And, and, and whether it was Mele the Alma, it was also Torah. A car is to get you to the yeshiva. Uh, if you have to talk finances, it's how you're going to make it through the next year. It, 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 it's all, all everything. His, his wisdom in Mele the Alma was Torah, pure Torah. That's what he was, but it was way beyond any words that he ever said. It's that picture that stays with us. And certainly, certainly, this was also mentioned, but I think one of the reasons, and it was certainly manifested because he cared and because he was, was so sincere, but he was a genius, he was a Goyen in knowing exactly, and some of the examples mentioned bring this out in giving out the exact precise measure of Yad Yamin and Yad Small for each student, for every single Talmud. If you had to hear it because you hadn't been to Minyan for a couple of days, you heard it. Oh, but there was another, that, that Yad Yamin was there. You know, that this was mentioned at the Shloshim, but it, it's worth repeating. The, I, had, I was living in Peterson Park in Chicago, which is on one side of where the Jewish community lives. A, a Rabbi Friedman, Ephraim Friedman, lives in West Rogers Park. And I can't remember exactly the occasion, but Rabbi Nyman was in town. And he had agreed to speak in, 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 in our shul, uh, based field in Peterson Park. So my daughter and I uh, went, Mrs. Kessler, my daughter and I went to visit Rabbi Nyman, hit by Rabbi Friedman. We went over there. We schmoozed a little bit over there. We walked all the way back to Peterson Park. Rabbi Nyman spoke. When he left, my daughter turns to me and she says, Abba, he never let go of your hand. That was one of his trademarks, right here. <laughs> that was one of his trademarks. And it was mentioned that Shloshim, he never let go. And I think that also is part of that feeling that we have. Even today, the memories, the closeness, the warmth, the love, the sincerity, he just never let go. And we never wanted him to let go. There are many encounters, and this really is another dimension there are many encounters that I had with Rabbi Nyman, and another thing that Rabbi Nyman was a real gone in was the concise phrase, whether it was in Hashkafa, whether it had to do with learning, who doesn't remember the red cap svara? And in Yevamis next year, there's the double homiletical flip, and many, many other such concise phrases that helped us get a picture of what the Svara really was all about. But there were so many times where he just said exactly the right thing in exactly the right way. I just want to share a couple of those. Back in 1968, I was just another one of those all-American Bachram walking into yeshiva. I didn't have trouble because I was already a little older and uh, uh, had a little more experience with uh, having to apply myself to all kinds of different stuff. The learning wasn't a problem, but I gotta tell you, the diktuk bahalocha really drove me bananas. I found it quite cumbersome. And nocha shayla, nocha this, leave me alone, I just came to learn. <laughs> you know, that was, that was the way. That... And a good chaver, who just also came to the yeshiva, but in the middle of the zman, flew off to the United States, got married, came back to Eretz Yisrael, it was after the sheva brachas, so we had a sheva brachas without the sheva brachas in the yeshiva. And Rabbi Nyman gets up to speak about Rabbi Baruch Zaychek. Now, Rabbi Baruch Zaychek, Kenai Nahar, is one of those people who always had a Shiloh. And he refers to Rabbi Zaychek as someone who appreciated the celestial heights of Olachat Chila. Whoa. <laughs> oh, boy, hey, Kalter, you know, you have a long way to go. You got to start growing up. You hear that? Celestial heights of a lechatchila. That's one example. That also, that first year in 1968, so uh, I was, had a work-study job. It was right after Sukkot, 
I had to set the tables for supper right before supper. I go downstairs, I'm starting to set the table, and in walks David Nyman, who was 11 years old. And uh, Rabbi Nyman sees me in the dining room, sees me setting the tables, turns to David and he says, David, Naftali Kalter sits and learns all day. Why don't you finish setting the table for him? What a lesson. What a simple, powerful lesson. First of all, this little schnook who just came to the yeshiva, oh, I'm somebody who learns all day. Uh-oh, <laughs> I guess I have to live up to that. But besides that, how much time do you think there was if I'm already setting up the table for supper that I'm going to run back up to the base medrash and still learn for another 10 minutes maybe, five minutes? I guess it was important. Powerful message, so simply, eloquently, beautifully conveyed. His accountability, you know, they spoke about the Fahers. He made sure, not just that you knew what you were talking about, but he made sure that you were really confident that you knew what you were talking about. When he gave you Fahir, a poker face would have been good enough. No, 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 no. He looked at you as if you just landed from Mars. There's no way we were sitting in the same room. That, 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 that this is the sheer that you heard? So that you, you know, there was only one thing to do. You had to really be sure that what you're saying is right. But that was all part of the test. When I got engaged, so in, those, in, in, in Washington Heights, they didn't have a vort. It was called a cookies and zauda. And this was right after davening on Shabbos. And uh, you go up to the in-law's house, and uh, you have some cookies and zauda. Your bishop, Master Tov, and everybody goes home. But anyway, so I was told, Rebbe, that this particular Shabbos, we're going off to Washington Heights for this particular event. It was an in Shabbos. Oh boy. <laughs> Did I get it. You couldn't wait another week or two? It's an in Shabbos, six hours of Seder, what are you doing? But. I don't know exactly, somehow it, we went that same Shabbos, but the message was so loud and clear again. A simple, solid, basic message. You're a chassan. You could keep yourself so busy for between now and the chassan you'll never have time to learn for a minute. You better make sure that you think through and have a cheshbin for every minute you take off for the sake of the chassan, the apartment, the works. The message was loud and clear. And then the last little incident also. In 1978, when uh, we were in Eretz Yisrael, so this was the first round. This one I got away with. The next year I didn't get away with it, but uh, New Haven wanted me to come as a Rebbe. And um, wasn't sure. A lot of calls back and forth, a little conversation with the Rashiva. And then I went over to Rabbi Nyman, and I said the following. I said, Rebbe, New Haven's offering me a job. I don't know. My wife and I sat down, and we did the numbers for next year. It doesn't work out. Naftali Kalter Kolel never works out on paper. That was it. But that gave me another year in the yeshiva. Again, short, sweet, to the point, memorable forever. Rebbe is no longer with, it, with us, but his profound influence remains. There are so many situations where we can hear his voice, envision his reaction as his message of the precious value of every minute of Torah. Every word of Torah remains so deeply embedded in our being. Should be a Melitz Yasher for the family, for Klal Yisrael. Je heet zich Roborg. On behalf of the Mishpacha, 
I'd like to thank the yeshiva and uh, all those who have come tonight to hear the inspiring words. And while it was certainly a special schus for all of us, it is definitely a great source of merit to Zaydi's neshama, Yehei Zichar Baruch. I want to thank all the speakers of tonight. Thank you very much. And before we begin with Mariv, just one brief announcement, very important, that uh, the yeshiva hopes to launch a one-day online campaign uh, some point next week. Details will follow, where they hope to raise the funds to dedicate the base medish wing of this building. And family and friends have already pledged to match dollar for dollar up to $250,000, thereby reaching the, raising the goal of $500,000. Bez Hashem. We will now begin with Marv.